Uh, thank you very much. I move on to item 7, the agenda, Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Scotland Bill. And this is an evidence session. And I welcome to meeting Right Honourable Lord Carley, Lord Justice Clark, Edward McHugh, Deputy Legal Secretary to the Lord President, and Sheriff Gordon Liddell, Vice President of the Sheriff's Association. Okay, thank you very much, Lord Carley, for your statement, which will, of course, go on the uh, Justice website. And uh, while I know Sheriff's Association didn't respond to ours, they did respond to the government's consultation. So I take it they've not changed their position since then. No, that's not true. Excellent. That makes it simple for us. Uh, can I now then go straight to questions from members, please? Margaret, Christian, Gill, John. Uh, good morning. The bill for the first time in Scotland introduces two statutory duty uh, jury directions which must be given by the judge in cert when certain evidence is led. I wonder if uh, you consider that um, statutory jury directions represent an unacceptable precedent with regard to the independence of the judiciary. Lord Carlyle. I, I, I wouldn't quite go that far. Um, the, the statutory jury directions have been introduced, as you know, in other jurisdictions uh, of the Commonwealth. Um, and I think what I'm trying to say is that uh, this could be done, um, but it is not what we would see as the best way of doing it. Uh, in other words, uh, we've suggested that uh, if what is wanted uh, is for these facts to be um, accepted by the courts, then the, way, the better way to do that is to declare that these facts are within judicial knowledge, which would enable a judge in any given case to give these directions without the necessity of there being any evidence. Uh, but it would, it, it would then leave it to the judge to decide in exactly what case these directions ought to be given. Um, the, 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 the position being that uh, Jury directions are, intend are intended to be real conversations in that sense between the judge and the jury. And uh, this is introducing a degree of not exactly artificiality, but it's quite a mechanistic way of doing things. And a requirement to tell the jury these facts without more is going to be problematic. Thank you. That's very helpful. I, can I just add, but you, you're a bit tougher in your statement about that, Lord Carloway. You say, what is proposed is that the judge should essentially take on the mantle of the prosecution in making statements of fact dressed up as law. Yeah, but that's what, a bit tougher, isn't it? it may, yes, I think, I think that's fair to say. That, uh, that, that there's a, what, what, what the Act would do is that they would require the, the judge to state facts as law. In other words, the law says that these are facts, uh, and these are facts which are designed to be in, uh, in favour of the complainer in the case. Now, that traditionally has been the mantle of the prosecutor to, to, to argue these matters before the jury, for the defence to make such submissions as they wish to do in response, and for the judge to act as the um, arbiter between them. Sheriff Little, do you want to comment? Uh, uh, yes, I'd I, I, perhaps add to that. I, uh, we take the view, and I don't think there's any difference between us, in, in the Sheriff's Association that, Association, that is, that there are, there are dangers involved in legislating for something that has to go in a, a, a jury speech. Uh, what occurs in just about every jury speech is a repetition to the jury of the fact that they are the masters of the facts and that anything that's said by the judge in charging the jury needn't be taken into account by them, and anything that's said by the prosecutor in the speech or said by the defence in the speech needn't be taken into account by them, and they're only there to indicate that that evidence exists and it should be taken into account, you know, that the, the jury may take it into account, depending on what they make of it. There is a place for what's being suggested in some trials, but no two trials are the same. And what, depending on the evidence that's come out in a trial, 
I think this could, this the sort of uh, suggestions could well find their place in a number of them. But there may equally be circumstances where, if this is mandatory and this has to be included in the jury speech, then what will be required is something to dilute it in order to fairly charge a jury and, and not encroach on the jury function, because the, the function of the judge is entirely different with a jury. I could see it almost having the adverse effect to what appears to be the desired effect, where if it was necessary that such words have to be used in every case, and you have a set of circumstances where you really have to tell the jury, however, it may well be that that is not the, 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 the case. That One thing, you could confuse a jury because they would wonder why are we being told one thing and then told another thing. You, you may, um, apart from that, there is almost a risk to run with juries that, although we feel anyway, that although you stress to a jury that something that is said by me as a judge need not be taken into account, they are looking for indicators from, from judges, and we have to go out of our way to avoid a jury being influenced in any way whatsoever by what we might say. And so, uh, to come back, what I'm really saying is that there's, there are life situations. No two jury charges are ever the same. Uh, we have the jury manual, which is a dynamic uh, uh, volume of suggestions and recommendations. And I think that uh, the place for such suggestions is in the jury manual, so that uh, judges dealing with a certain uh, array of facts and evidence that's come out can look at that and decide whether such a thing should be included in the charge or not. I would also suggest that uh, on the back of that, we have the High Court, and if uh, a judge at first instance, which is what it is with a jury, makes an error, then it's correctable. What about the role of expert witnesses in giving the same, I suppose, information? Uh, yes, the, the, the current position is that, um, that there is provision, specific provision in the 1995 Act um, as is mentioned, I think, in the statement for the Crown to lead evidence basically to the same effect as is stated in the, in the bill. Uh, the Crown can do that, but to do that in every case would be, would be very expensive. Uh, on the other hand, in many cases, uh, the, that evidence is, is basically agreed because ultimately it's not controversial uh, so that um, the Crown will have an expert report and they, they can go to the defence and say, well, will you agree th th that, for example, th there can be good reasons why a person has not reported an incident for a year, two years, 20 years? Um, and the joint minute which will agree the evidence is usually much more expansive than what is contained in the bill and will, be, will, will contain greater explanations for what is um, contained in the bill. But following on from what Sheriff Liddell is saying, one can envisage the situation where if a judge gives the jury the direction which is stated in the bill, uh, as Sheriff Liddell is saying, one can just imagine the judge immediately going on to say, however, in this case, you will have to consider whether the delay in reporting is significant or not, uh, or, or the same thing would apply in the later proposed directions. And there's a danger of achieving exactly the opposite of what the bill is intended by ultimately focusing on something which is not an issue. In other words, if nobody has said um, uh, in the jury speech that the, the, the delay in reporting um, is significant, why focus on it? Only just one small point about the minute of agreement. It won't be the first time a very skilled um, defence lawyer has brushed over the minute of agreement and then made a, a lot of some other points um, which then have put doubts in, in the jury's mind. So I'm always very sceptical about just the use of the minute of agreement. No, no I, I agree with that. Even if these facts were agreed, that the, 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 the fact that there can be good reasons why a person would not report does not preclude the defence from saying that in a given case it should be regarded by the jury as significant and the, the question is, is is whether it's perceived that a judge stating these 
um, will actually achieve the object of the bill, which is intended, I think, to reverse perceived misconceptions in the minds of the jury. Uh, that, that would be odd for, the, for that to happen when set against what Sheriff Little has said is our standard introduction, which is, we are the masters of the law, you must pay attention to what we're saying about the law, you are the masters of the fact, it's a matter entirely for you, the jury, to decide what to make of the evidence. Gil, the trouble is everybody's going to be asking about jury direction, so there really are no supplementaries in this, I suspect. Uh -huh. you're, ju you're just next after Christian, but I think we really will be focusing on jury directions. Mm -hmm. Christian, and then it's you, Gil. Yes, and it's, and it's in direction. Good morning. Uh, I just wanted to ask the panel if they were aware of uh, some of the evidence uh, that Professor uh, Vanessa Munro uh, has, uh, has given us using mock juries. And uh, I, we heard from Lord Calloway this morning already saying that other jurisdictions have uh, already using uh, this, this kind of procedure. So just wanted to know if you knew about the evidence out there. We are aware of the research which was carried out by Professor Munro and her, and her colleague, um, which is referred to in the consultation paper. I, I have not myself looked at the research behind that, but I'm aware of, of what it is, is suggesting, which is that there is a... a uh, I, I could, uh, there is a view that some members of the jury may have preconceived views about the matters in the bill. So that, that is accepted, which is why um, the Crown leading evidence to rebut such things um, may well be a good idea. And as I've said, I think, in the written statement, that the, the, the idea that these facts should be regarded as judicial knowledge may well be a good idea to enable the judge to give these directions in a suitable case. Has any of the members of the panel have looked at the research? I, I've read the research, in the, uh, as, as Lord Carlo has said, it's in the, um, the um, document that was per, per the SPICE briefing, but not the research behind it. I, I don't want to be critical of the research, but it's only a very small sample that was taken and uh, three scenarios that were set up. I, it might well be the case, and I think probably could be imagined that's the case, that each juror, as a member of the public and ordinary member of the public, brings with them, in, in most anodyne way, I mean this, certain prejudices. They bring with them their own feelings, their own views on things. And th that, th th those views will be covering all manner of things, and not just this single aspect of it. And I. Short of abolishing duties, I don't see how you can actually address that. Oh, we, we heard about this evidence and how these misconceptions are very much present, not only in juries but in society at large, and, and that this act would be a way uh, to address those. And particularly when we talk about uh, how to address them, uh, if we talk about appropriate time, will be at, you know at the start of the procedure. And, and regarding cases, it will be for all cases attributed to this uh, particular uh, 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 subject. And uh, I'm, I'm a bit surprised when I when I when I read some of the uh, submissions saying that uh, it should be only at appropriate time and appropriate cases. It seems to miss the point that uh, regarding with the evidence that it should be for every cases and at the start of the procedures. The, the directions would be given at the end um, of the, uh, they'd be given in the charge to the jury at the end of the case. Um, and the, the, it's suggested um, in, I think, some of the, 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 uh, the, the documents accompanying the bill that it would remain for the judge to decide exactly what was said. <laughs> now, I'm not sure that's right, because if, if, the, if an Act of Parliament says the, ju the judge must advise that and then states exactly States. Actually, actually uh, Lord Carloway, in section 6, subsection 3, there is a, a, an opt-out clause there which says subsection 2, which is mandatory, does not apply if the judge considers that in the circumstances of the case no reasonable jury could consider the evidence, question or statement by reason of which subsection 2 would otherwise apply to material to the question where they alleged. So there's still some judicial discretion. There's a, a judicial discretion as to whether to give the directions, yes. yes. But if you, if you decide that it is a case where, which applies to the case, you must give this particular direction. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, I, I don't think the Act, uh, in its present form, allows the judge to, to, to vary it in some way. That would seem to be contrary to what Parliament would state. Okay. And it, it remains the case that if, if you can imagine a, 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 a charge to the jury actually taking place in a given case, the judge is going to say, I am required to advise you that there can be no good reason why a person, etc. Yes. And at the end of that, the judge is then free to give such other directions as he thinks is appropriate to achieve the appropriate balance of fairness in the case. And that's, that's what would cause me concern that, that, um, that what the Act is going to do is, to, is in certain cases it's going to focus an issue for the jury which is not really something in dispute. Okay. I understand. But, Christian, no, sorry, but just I'm, to clarify I'm not that, saying, yeah. I, don't, I don't think any of us are saying, no, I don't think any of us have any problem with this type of direction being given in appropriate cases. We think that there may also be force in the view that some judges might be reluctant to give these directions in the absence of evidence to support them, that is to say evidence in the case. But the way around that is to state that these are judicial knowledge and then that enables the judge to, to state these as fact. Judge, say that just now. You know, that just because it's a, you know, a, general, a general statement uh, or do they do a specific in a case? What do judges say at the end if someone has delayed reporting, didn't show signs of violence? What would a judge actually say just now, if anything, in directions to the jury or a sheriff, for that matter, or any other? Well, again, um, I'll answer that question. The, the answer is it's, 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 it's variable. As, as I think is recognised. But if you can imagine that there has been a delay in reporting, now there's, there's, there can be different types yeah. of delay. There can be a, a delay of a week, there can be a delay of a year, there can be a delay of 20 years. Uh, imagine the, the, the dynamic of the trial. Somebody is going to ask the complainer why there was a delay in reporting. And the complainer will give a response to that. Uh, and the, the, the response will be, could be a number of things. Uh, therefore, if there is an explanation from the complainer as to why uh, there has been a delay in reporting, which can be due with, to do with embarrassment, etc., all sorts of things, not wanting to uh, go through the trial process and so on and so forth, then the judge will listen to what is said about that in the speech from the Crown and from the speech of the defence and will then try to balance these two things up. But in the situation that we're envisaging here, just focusing on this section rather than the other two, uh, uh, many judges will say, of course, ladies and gentlemen, you will appreciate that just because someone has not reported an incident for a period of a week, a month, a year, whatever it is, it means that the incident did not happen. You have to listen to what the complainer said about that, why she didn't report. You have to appreciate there may be many reasons why somebody does not report it. On the other hand, you have the submission of defence counsel to the effect that this is significant, and that is something that you will have to bear in mind when uh, assessing the credibility and reliability of the complainer. That would be relatively commonplace. On the other hand, some judges would not go into the issue and they would just leave it for the jury to determine. If, if I may, one of the uh, things that uh, I see, certainly I think all of us see in every charge to a jury, is that on the one hand, depending on what the jury is made of the evidence, they may draw certain inferences from the evidence but they're given a specific warning against speculation. And this would, if, if such a thing arose in a, in, a, in a trial that I was dealing with, I think probably all of my colleagues, that it was suggested that there could be speculation, this would be the area of speculation, then there might well be a warning given against that and with a specific reference to a piece of evidence to illustrate to the jury that that there they could be entering into the realm of speculation rather than drawing a reasonable inference from evidence which exists. Thank you. That was very helpful. Gil. Thank you. Convener. I wonder if uh, the panel could uh, tell me if one individual jury member uh, that you were aware that they had preconceived ideas on a matter, how would you react to that? If it came to light during the course of the trial yeah. that a jury had um, views which um, suggested that he or she considered that a person could not be guilty of rape if um, there was no use of violence, something like that. Yeah, something. Well, maybe I should explain. Maybe, maybe if you, you were aware that someone before the trial started had preconceived ideas. 
of of a nature. I'm not sure that we would ever know that no, unless somebody unless they put it on a Facebook or something. Yeah. Um, that be. <coughs> but so if, if if we did, if then you knew, some, if you knew, if we did know, somebody would object to that juror sitting yes. on the jury. Okay. Yeah. So the evidence, <laughs> the, the evidence from Professor uh, Vanessa Munro suggests that the public, never mind juries, the public themselves mm -hmm. have preconceived ideas how someone should react. In other words, if someone comes in that claims rape, should shouldn't be calm. They shouldn't be calm. They should act in a particular way, yes. or they should automatically have resisted. So they should be, they have, they should be injured in some fashion, and that doesn't always happen. So, if if this, uh, and there's other evidence uh, that suggests the same thing, mainly coming from women's groups, uh, it's you know it's it's anecdotal uh, evidence. When you're engaged in that area, they talk about it all the time. Uh, but, however, um, if that is the case, if, it is, if this, this evidence stacks up, shouldn't we need, should we not need to do something about it? If, we, if, if you would react to one jury member, but the evidence would suggest a good number of the general public have got preconceived ideas how people should perform and act in, 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 a, in a case when it comes to it. I don't think, that, again, we're, we're, not, um, we're not in any way suggesting that in a given case, what is contained in the bill should not be said to juries in, 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 a, in a given case. Um, there, what we are saying uh, is that what is proposed is not procedurally the best way to go about it, nor in practical terms is it the best way to go about it. We, we, again, there is, a, there, there, is a, there, there is an element of, um, to some extent, trusting the judges to um, act in an appropriate way in an, in an appropriate case, and if that is why, if it is, if the suggestion is made during the course of the trial, by, for example, defence counsel, of the nature that you're suggesting, I personally would expect the judge or sheriff to react to that comment and to correct it. Um, that 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 would be part of his or her job to do that, but to to make it a mandatory direction in in, uh, in almost all cases. Um, it, it, is, it causes the problem, and I, I, I know I'm repeating myself here to some extent. Again, imagining the dynamic of the trial as it happens, and you, and you giving the jury the direction required by Parliament, fine. Then the judge is going to go on. He will, he, he, he will, he or she will go on to say, you have to look at look at this case and the evidence in this case. It's, 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 we give juries direction specifically to deal with um, general prejudices in the case. We, we give jury directions that they must decide the case purely on the evidence which is led before them. And one would expect, in the, in, again, in the dynamic of the jury room, if someone has a, a prejudice of some description, then the other jurors would presumably attempt to address that in their, in their deliberations. They may not, but... Uh, uh, I would expect that they would. And, and how, how would you overcome, if, if the evidence is correct, that there's a percentage of the public, and they, they don't see it as a, a prejudice, they, they see the way people act and react and how they compose themselves in a case like this, and if they don't conform to that, they're automatically not believed. There's a, there's the, the evidence would suggest the members of the public and juries. So every trial that takes place, it would suggest there will be people there who have got preconceived ideas, and they don't mean to do it. It's 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 not that they're bad people. It's just that they, they think that this woman, or even a man now, uh, that that we can talk about, this this person must be lying because they're not react, they're not acting the way that I expect them to act. It, this didn't happen. So if that is the case, if, if the evidence suggests that that is the case, how do we overcome that? Uh, you know, how, how do we, other than some education uh, through you know, the Scottish Government, or but I would think that the court is the best place to do it. Uh, you know, people are presenting there and listening to evidence, but if they are wrong at the start, I think, uh, sorry, do you think it, it, it should be explained or is there a better reason why not to explain you, you, you've raised a very interesting point about the way people think generally or, or uh, in society, but um, 
we're trying to look at this from the, the, uh, a very practical point of view. We're not in any way suggesting that efforts should not be made to correct misconceptions in juries. Uh, and in a given case, the judge will be expected to do that if it's detected. Um, but we go back to what we've said already. We, we the judges, are, uh, direct the jury on the law which is to be applied to the case. That's, that's our primary purpose. We, we say to juries at the beginning, um, the facts are for you. It's for you to assess the witnesses and to make up your minds, applying your collective common sense. That's the function of the jury. When, and the judge, if a judge is seen to dictate or attempt to dictate to a jury on what facts should or should not be found, again, you're in the realms of uh, uh, what, what one is saying is being counterproductive. I don't think I can answer your question um, about how to, to, to deal with this problem other than to say we've offered an alternative solution which we think would fit in with our system rather better than what is proposed here and would work from a more practical point of view. And if, again, if we, if we go back to approaching these facts as judicial knowledge, then we can go back to our judicial institute and say, right, devise some model directions along the lines that they have done in England. <coughs> I'm yeah. And now I've got John <coughs> followed by Alison <coughs> Roger. Jordan, please. Uh, thank you. Um, Lord Calloway, uh, if I note you collector, you talked about use the phrase appropriate manner, but of course it is the case that not all judges act in an appropriate manner, and I'm having particular regard to the Court of Appeals ruling in the last couple of weeks, where there was criticism made of the, the, the judge um, who uh, was quoted as saying that the victim of multiple rapes had acquiesced in these rapes, and uh, there was comment made about delayed reporting, and the fact that the victim continued to um, cohabit with the accused. Um, so I, I'm trying to understand the difference between comment and direction and when there's an overlap there. Are you able to give some guidance on that, please? Um, the, the case to which you're referring to, the important thing to, to bear in mind in that case is that there is no criticism whatsoever of the judge's directions uh, to the jury in that case, nor indeed in his conduct of the trial. Uh, and uh, the convictions followed in what was rather, uh, quite an unusual um, trial with a, with a um, uh, well, an unusual trial. So there is no criticism of the judge there, and I'm not aware of any criticism of judges' directions to the jury on the particular points with which this bill is concerned. The relationship between comments that a judge would make and, and, and direction, you say directions on the, the specifics of the law, no, the, there, there's been no criticism of the judges. No, uh, in general, right? If we, if we set that case aside, then in general, please. I, I wonder if you could ask your... What's your question, John, in the general question? Um, judges will make comments, presumably, um, in, in the course of their direction, they'll make comments on what's been heard, and they will comment in relation to, specifically in relation to their position on the legal issues that that gives rise to. In the course of directions to the jury, yes. a, a judge will be expected to, re to direct the jury in accordance with our well-known um, principles and practice. And uh, again, I go back to, to stating that I'm unaware of any criticism of a judge's directions uh, to the effect which would contradict or in any way affect what is contained in the bill. Um, I think what you're referring to are not directions to a jury nor indeed any statements made during the course of the trial, but certain comments which were made by the judge at the point when he is reporting to the appeal court on the reasons for his sentencing. Uh, they, these reports are, um, they are released to parties. Uh, they may be mentioned during the course of the appeal proceedings. If the, the, it's very important that a judge should feel free to state exactly why he has selected a particular sentence, and to be um, to be given free rein to explain his reasoning. If during the course of that reasoning he he says something which which is which the appeal court determines is wrong, then we will say that, uh, as we did in the particular case, we will um, expect the judge to take into account what the appeal court's uh, view is, and act accordingly. In sexual offences generally in relation to 
the matters which you've uh, raised, um, as I think I've, uh, I, I hope um, Ms McInnes has got my re reply, you, 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 as I'm sure the committee will appreciate, uh, in relation to the prosecution of um, sexual offences and indeed the sentencing of sexual offences, the law is progressing and it's moving from a certain position where it was 20, 30, 40 years ago into the modern era. And we are trying to keep the law so far as um, both approaches to directions and in relation to sentencing in tune with modern thinking. You were referring, for example, to the, uh, something called acquiescence or condonation, as it's, as it's sometimes said. The reason why that was being mentioned was in, the, in a particular case in the late 80s, which was the first case in which a husband had been prosecuted for the rape of his non-extranged wife, in which it so happens I was the advocate deputy at first instance. Um, that went to the appeal court, and the appeal court there, the Lord Justice General in that case, made remarks of that nature, um, primarily in relation to whether a person should be prosecuted or would be prosecuted for the rape of his wife with whom he was continuing to live, where the wife had, as it was put, forgiven the act. So, you know, we're sitting on an appeal court decision of that nature where these words have been used. Um, they have also been used, uh, or, or similar words have been used, in the sense of, the, of, of whether whether the fact that someone is continuing to live with someone is something that should be taken into account, not in relation to the rape, which would be proved, and there's a conviction, but whether that is a significant feature on sentencing. And, and the issue of uh, the continued cohabitation with someone and the effect that it has on sentencing is something that I think most jurisdictions are wrestling with, and there are different views being expressed in the Commonwealth as to how significant that is, not in relation to whether the person was raped, not in relation to conviction, but simply in relation to the appropriate sentence in that type of case. I'm grateful yes. for that detailed ex explanation. Uh, there's not everyone that gets the Lord Justice Clark's personal explanation like that. So public perception is very important. And it is out there some, some terms, and I won't repeat some of them, that people would find deeply offensive. Now, I have to say, I, I want to maintain an open mind on this, and I, I'm, that's why I, I'm trying to understand uh, to what extent there is freedom afforded a judge to make comment in general terms um, away from uh, the specifics of direction on law. Clarify. I think John's point is, if we say jury directions are a specific thing at the end of the, the evidence that's led, at any point if a judge makes a highly inappropriate remark, which might affect the impact of the, the jury decision, and yet it's not actually in the jury directions, what's the redress or what impact does that have? on that decision. I think that's what you're separating remarks made in the process of the trial separately from jury directions. Well, not entirely, no. no I, you're not? I, I, I think if, if we, we, the totality of summing up, presumably a judge can say things that might be determined as um, legal direction and there will be comment allied to that. Could I comment, I, yes, I, if I may, on this? I, 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 I'm sure that uh, the, the members of the committee do understand how a, a jury trial unfolds, but it might be important just to just to lay that out. But you know, the judge is sitting and listening to all of the evidence and takes notes of all of the evidence and will review that evidence when it comes to charging the jury. There's a a, a prosecution speech first of all to the jury, and that the, the prosecutor will probably suggest what the jury should make of the evidence. There's then a def defence speech where the defence will probably suggest to the jury what they make of the evidence. That's listened to by the judge. The judge hears all of that. And it's at the end of that, the judge, having heard that, will modify perhaps what that judge thought would go into the charge. And the charge is dynamic. The charge deals with everything, the evidence that's come into the case and what's been said in the speeches. And it's at that point the judge will be at pains to say that 
the, the judge is the master of the law and gives the jury what, what assistance they require in understanding the law that has to be applied, but that the facts are for them and make certain, if, if necessary, draw attention to parts of the evidence only because the jury has to know what to do with that, how they take it into account and where they place it if they make something of it. But it's, it's a very dynamic situation and every case turns on its own uh, circumstances. If you have something which is mandatory, then the biggest danger in that is the unintended consequences, where because of that takes prominence to such an extent that I, as a judge I may be required by law to interfere to an extent with the jury function, which I would never do. You know, it's, it's hardwired into judges that they don't interfere with the jury function, which is a consideration of the evidence. Can I ask then, finally, and I mean this as respectfully as I want to, I mean, do, do you resent um, lawmakers suggesting an approach like this? Because as we've heard from Mr Patterson, there's real genuine public concern about, about these matters. As I say, you know, I, I'm probably am pro-minded more for the, 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 the prosecution leading a, an expert witness, but is there a resentment on the part of the judiciary that, that politicians are interfering? I wouldn't describe it in, as a resentment. No, we, we're, we are uh, we're all members of a democracy. We respect Parliament's um, uh, uh, function as legislators. If, 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 if Parliament wishes the judges to... However coming, though. Well, there, there, there may be a however, but in, in a sense, but um, we're <laughs> we don't get upset uh, in that way. If, you, if Parliament wants to, wants to tell us to give the jury these directions, we'll give them. Um, and and uh, we'll certainly do that. Uh, but we have, I think, uh, stated that uh, traditionally it's, it's, uh, it's, the, it's the role of the judge to give a jury's directions rather than Parliament. Um, and that's the way it has been insofar as the division of constitutional responsibilities is. But um, uh, the, 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 that only takes you so far. It's, it's why it's... it's um, uh, in any jurisdiction in the Commonwealth, it's rare, um, very rare, for Parliament to dictate to the judges what they should say in jury directions. It's been done in a couple of jurisdictions in this particular area. So if, if you want us to do it here, then we'll do it here. But um, we're just saying this is not necessarily the best way to do it. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that if we make that law, you won't break it. I no, understand absolutely. that. That's, that's handy. Yeah. Uh, a bit of difficulty for you. Alison, followed by Roderick, please. Thank you. If I might just have a follow-up to, to what Mr Finney has, has said and, and then go on to my main question. I, I, I suppose I'm concerned that if a judge, in giving his reasons for sentencing to an appeal court, um, has views that are um, so significantly out of step that it, it, it results in you describing them as pithy, then surely we can we can expect that those strong views would be present all the time in that judge's consideration um, and would influence whether or not he gave a direction to the jury about any particular thing. Is that not the case? Uh, it, it, uh, again, I'm, I'm anxious not to, 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 to stray into a particular yes, case because I, 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 we, 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 we said all that we really wanted to say about it in the opinion of the appeal court. And as I think I've, I've written, the, the word pithy wasn't intended to be pejorative. It was just saying these were succinct remarks which the judge made on certain areas of sentencing. But that, the, 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 the particular directions in that case, so far as we are aware, were impeccable. And there's no sense of the judge's remarks which he sent to the appeal court being contained. It is, it, it is the absence of direction, perhaps. <laughs> in relation to something. You've said that in other cases, a number, and I don't want to talk about that particular case, but just draw from that, that you've said that some judges give directions in some areas in relation to some of the things that Mr Patterson spoke about, and some don't. What we're trying to get to the bottom of is why don't they? Um, and is it basically the, 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 the belief system that they themselves hold? No. No, the, 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 the reason um, why there is a, a problem in this area is that some judges take a very strict view of what they can tell the jury. In other words, um, some judges say, well, 
it is, if we take the, this proposition, there, is, there can be good reasons why a person may not tell others about it for, for a while. Some judges will take a strict view, well, in this case, there is no evidence to support that proposition. Therefore, I should not give a jury a direction of that nature. Of course, the Crown may lead evidence that um, it is the case, in which case they will give the direction. Other judges may be rather more proactive in their approach of what they say to juries, and they may give the directions contained here without there being an evidential base for it. If they do so, then, of course, they risk, uh, the, they risk the appeal court stating to them, you should not have given that direction because in this particular case there was no evidence to support it. That's the, that's the problem area, which is why I think this legislation is in contemplation. And there is that difference in view between different members of the judiciary. That's helpful. Um, can I turn to the jury manual, which Sheriff Liddell described as a dynamic document? Can you explain to us how that document is changed over time, uh, how and when it's amended, and um, I suppose why model directions for this situation have not yet been developed? Yes, I can certainly t t t say uh, to help you with these. The, the jury manual um, is a fairly substantial document, which is it's online if you if you wish to to, to view it um, in its entirety, and uh, it. it, it but you can see what it looks like in yeah. the sense that it's, it's something which we've created over the last 20 or so years where uh, in a, from a situation where there was nothing essentially except kind of word of mouth and it contains two different things it contains first of all perceived uh, statements of what the law is thought to be and it contains model directions to the jury which judges do not have to follow and, and will not follow depending on the particular circumstances of the case. And a lot of judges will have their own styles of speaking, etc., which is not consistent with the jury manual. The jury manual is, uh, 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 is under the auspices of a committee headed by one of the High Court judges um, who will um, revise its terms um, on a... I'm not sure if it's exactly an annual basis, but it, it is, it's under... It's in a, position of constant revision. And if a judge, for example, has a particular problem with the direction or some, or some new case arises, or of course if Parliament decided that this was a direction which had to be given, then the jury manual would be amended. And it's then sent out to the whole judiciary in, in, in amended form. Um, is, is that... Have I, have I, got, have, I may have missed well, something. Well, yes, you, you, you said basically earlier on that, um, you know, the, the law was moving and, 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 and things were changing in relation particularly to sexual cases. I mean, women would say that the progress is, is glacial, I have to say. I'm trying to understand at what point um, someone is able to suggest that perhaps... Uh, you, you refer to it as judicial knowledge, yes? So that, that would make its way into a model direction, would it? If it, if, it, if it was judicial knowledge, it would enable a judge to um, give a direction because there, was that w there would then be no fear that there was no mm -hmm. um, lack of evidential base because it, judicial knowledge is basically a statement of, of things that are um, ex universally acceptable, yeah. mm -hmm. like the basic rules of mathematics or, or, and, or geography. So that if, if Parliament said these are facts that right. are judicial knowledge, that means the judge does not have to worry about giving the jury a direction which has no evidential okay. base. He or she would be able to state that without fear of contradiction. Okay, so that's a separate... Uh, but you, I remember issue. you did, it, you did, you did yeah. ask why, the, 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 why this particular yeah. uh, was not in the jury manual. Yeah. I understand, um, having spoken to the Judicial Institute, who, who, who tend to... Um, deal with these, that, that, that it was put on hold. This, this is not criticism, but when the consultation document came out, the, the, this area was left um, to see what was going to happen. Yeah. Um, maybe, that, maybe we should have proceeded to, to develop model directions yes, at that point. I, I, I suppose that it had not uh, until then ever been in people's awareness that there perhaps should be model directions for that. That's what I'm trying to get at. How do judges or, or, or the people in charge of the, the jury manual say we need to update judicial thinking? Manual. Judicial manual. Not the jury manual. Sorry, they judicial manual. No, no, well, it's, 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 called, it's called, it's called the, the jury manual. manual. For Is it really? Yes. Sorry, I beg your pardon. <laughs> I, so. I drifted there, sorry. 
Um, no, the, 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 this area has been under contemplation for some time in the sense that the, the, the amendment to the 1995 Act, which enabled the Crown to lead evidence, um, which was, uh, it, uh, was it 2004? I think it was the, the amendment was made, was because of the same conceptions that we have now that, there, that, that some jury members may think may have a preconception. Therefore, let's, let's allow the Crown to lead evidence which would previously probably have been regarded as inadmissible because it's really evidence about, directly about somebody's credibility, which we, tr we tend to exclude as collateral. So the, the, the thing has been under contemplation. Um, and um, it, it, it may be that we should have followed the English line sooner and, and got some model directions out. Um, I, I, that's, that's, I accept that. Okay, thank you. Can I just uh, to tell you one piece of information because I had the benefit of uh, hearing from the uh, director of the Judicial Institute very recently. The jury manual has uh, very recently gone online for the first time uh, exclusively and it's no longer, it used to be published on an annual basis as Lord Carlyle currently says. Uh, my understanding is that that means that it's continually updated now and when something happens, a decision from the High Court or whatever or a recommendation then that's something that's just a continuing process because it's online and it's easier to do that. Sorry, a little debate going on here about judicial knowledge and jury, jury manuals, which uh, we'll, we'll save for later. Um, and next have uh, Roderick followed by Margaret. I think it's Margaret McDougall. Yes. Um, morning, panel. Most of my questions have been answered, but I just wanted to put something to you that, that was suggested in our evidence session by Mr. Meehan, um, representing effective advocates. He said if matters were in the, uh, the jury manual, um, there would still be a danger that, that there would be a direction on which no evidence had been led. Do you think that is a real danger? <coughs> yeah, um, yes. The, the, uh, until, until one, um, uh, I, I, I understand. That, although I don't, I don't have the precise name of the case. That, that south of the border, um, w where there are model directions, um, there have been instances, or at least an instance, where the judge has gone off piste, so to speak, and given a direction which is a little further than that, and that has been criticised as not having an evidential base. But somebody could, pe people are quite capable of challenging the jury manual directions as not being correct in law, or um, there could be a challenge on the basis that a particular um, direction in the jury manual did not have an evidential base in fact. So it is a possibility, we would, and we would have to decide um, whether that was well founded or not. Does that answer? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. It, 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 he's, he's basically saying that if, if this was not statutory and was just simply in the jury manual, um, is it possible that, say, a conviction was overturned because a judge had given a direction which, didn't, which was in the jury manual but did not have an evidential base? And the answer to that is, well, possibly, but, uh, because from time to time we do get challenges to the contents of the jury manual because it's not, it's not law, it's guidance. Thank you. Um, he also uh, went on to, to, to discuss the, the question of what would happen if there were mandatory directions in this area, um, that uh, that would set a precedent and, and, and in the absence of jury research, he wasn't sure whether the jury would find that helpful um, if, if there was a pressure to be considered across the board. Uh, what view do you take about the, the precedent issue? And would jury research assist? In, as uh, obviously we're, we're now embarking on an era of jury research. Well, the, the, uh, uh, the Cabinet Secretary, I don't think, has given us the, 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 the full scope of the proposed research. Mm. Um, but uh, this would be an obvious area, certainly, in which to see if the if the if the if the um, research carried out by Professor Monroe and her colleague um, is is correct it's not quite the right word but is is, is um, valid um, I'm not quite sure how to answer your question um, I'm trying to say the distinction between valid and correct 
the point that this would be an idea there for jury research. But yeah. in terms of it, just uh, set its on its own setting a precedent is. Um, if, it, we were, if we were to proceed with mandatory directions. Well, that, that's the sort of general constitutional yeah. position which I was anxious not to, yeah. um, not to say that we were, um, um, Mr. Finney's comments in relation to um, whether we, got, <laughs> we resented it or got upset. Yes, it does set a precedent because obviously if, if there is, if there is a, a, a parliament is dictating uh, uh, what should be said to juries by a judge in this area, then no doubt in other areas, other people will, may seek to uh, extend that and wish other directions to be given, which is where we get into the constitutional divide. Okay, thank you. By that, I take it the concerns that that becomes politicians, the very, very clear and important line between the judiciary and politicians will have been breached. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's not good news, is it? No, well, it, it's, uh, we, we would not think so. It would, um, <laughs> it, 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 uh, mutual respect is a very important thing, which I think we have in this jurisdiction. And would it not be important also to retain the tensions between the judiciary and the politicians, tensions that are useful for democracy? But is that, would you subscribe to that? I would. The balance, is, the balance is very important that there remains that form of tension, as long as it doesn't um, drift into resentment. <laughs> oh, I'm not, I wasn't suggesting that for a moment. What's your view on that, Sheriff? I mean, I, I, I have concerns. I mean, you're obvious from what I'm saying, I have concerns about this section. I, I, I agree entirely with what Lord Carlyle said on this. That the, the, these tensions are important, and that the distinction is uh, important. And once the, I, I, I tend to think of things in terms of if, if there's a clear and defined line, and it's crossed. Quite often, the line then disappears when you look back and it's gone. Margaret. Thank you, convener, and uh, good afternoon, panel. I wish to ask uh, questions around um, sexual risk orders. And one of the features of the sexual risk order is that in the bill, as introduced, the order may be imposed on a person who has not been convicted of any offence, but who has done an act of a sexual nature. And an act of sexual nature is not defined in the bill. So um, could the panel perhaps uh, give me their understanding of what an act of a sexual nature is as provided in the bill? It's not something which the, 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 the judges have expressed any views on. We, 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 but, um, we regarded this as primarily a matter of policy for... Parliament, and um, we, we really did not have any views on it at all. Um, it was something that um, was entirely a matter for Parliament to determine, and we would um, address it in a, in a given case. But I'm sorry I can't help further than that, but we just thought this was policy. Okay. Could I... Well, maybe you, you won't wish to answer any of the questions around this, then, because it's not in your... <laughs> it's it's, it's that we, did, we didn't think it was a... We, were, we thought we were straying into... I don't think we right. comment. OK. So are you concerned about the fact that sexual risk orders could be imposed on an individual who has not committed any offence? Is that... It's, it's not something we've, 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 we've regarded as... We, we haven't... We have not made any. The judges have not made any comment on the on the validity or otherwise of this okay. legislation on the basis that it was go government policy, and, and a matter for Parliament to rule upon, rather than the judges to comment upon. Is there, is there an issue, however, that one of these orders can be imposed without the right of an appearance of the person uh, to prevent it being imposed upon them? Is there any issue there under ECHR? Can you comment on that? I mean, from a legal point of view. Well, the, 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 the matter is judicially determined by the sheriff, so um, it, it, it would be. Um... It says it, it says here. I'm mean, looking at this. When application is made for a sexual risk order under section 20, the person against whom the order is being sought it would have the right to make oral representation before a sexual risk order is imposed. Can you clarify whether or not, in a case where the application is being made for a sexual risk order under that, they do have a right 
not just it's discretionary, they have a right to address that. That's as I understand it, yes. They do. Well, it's, it's absolute. Well, they, 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 the application is to go to, is, is to, go to the, sh the sheriff. Um, I don't, I don't think I'm in a, uh, in a position to address this particular section of the bill. It's not something which I thought I was going to be asked about. That's what, sorry, I, I phrased it wrongly. Long day. It's a procedural matter. Under section 26, if I read it through, it, it says, it doesn't actually say, if I'm reading it, I'm, I'm maybe reading it too quickly, that procedurally the party has a right to appear before the sheriff. Am I right or wrong? <laughs> it just says in section, subsection 2, an appropriate sheriff may make a sexual risk or only if satisfied the respondent has done an act of a sexual nature, etc. And then it goes on. It doesn't at any point say that the party has a right to be heard. Well, um, again, um, it's not something that I've applied my mind to, and I, um, it would be something which we may be called upon to rule upon if there is a problem of that nature. Yes. Obviously, Parliament has obtained the usual certificate about yeah, ECHR compliance, and um, it, it would depend on the procedural rules that were, were surrounded this. There's a right of appeal, but it seems that uh, it would be better if you had an opportunity yeah. at the first hearing to make a representation yeah. rather than go through appellate procedure. Yeah. I mean, the, these, 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 these replace existing forms of order, the, the, um, the sexual ha the harm orders. Um, yeah. and the and my last question then, as I see, you know, Margaret, are you? Please do, yeah. Um, if they were able to comment then on the reasons for the very low numbers of RSHOs which have been granted by the courts in Scotland to date. I, I cannot comment on that. I've done okay. no research at all on that matter. I'm terribly sorry, but it, it's, I was not anticipating um, answering questions on Chapter 4 of the Bill for, for the reasons that, we regard, again, we regarded this as a matter of policy. Well, and I, 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 well that's a matter for the court, surely. Yeah. I'm I professor, can. did I call you professor? Yeah. No, sure. no, no, no. <laughs> oh, I thought I could hang on to that for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm really sorry. There's nothing I can add to that. I didn't come prepared for this sort of question and uh, I, again we thought that it was policy and something therefore that we shouldn't in, even uh, comment on if, if you want us to take this away and think about whether Listen, we, we can make a comment I'd be happy to do that and write in if there's if there's if you feel appropriate yes yes, yes. can I just ask a fine Final question I'm probably going to regret asking as I've already muddled up with professors and whatnot how do you, how does something become judicial knowledge and how do we know that it's judicial knowledge? Judicial knowledge is something which um, uh, grows over time. So um, there, are, there, are, there are certain things that you don't have to prove uh, and um, such as the fact that there's a railway between Edinburgh and Glasgow and things like that. You don't, you don't, that the, the, it's basic stuff. Yeah, it's, it's basic stuff which we, we all, which the, 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 everybody ought to know and it, it's accepted as fact. So the fact that somebody doesn't report something of a, a sexual nature for a period of time, for a longer period of time, is that judicial knowledge? Does that fall into that category? That the, could you say it could be a month, it could be years? Would that be just the fact that that sometimes in general happens that that's judicial knowledge as well, just like the railway line. I would, I would, personally, I think that the propositions which are contained in the bill may well be judicial knowledge because I do not think what is stated is controversial as a matter of fact. I think what okay. is stated is correct and therefore in that sense it is judicial knowledge. I don't think necessarily every member of the judiciary would share that view. Now, it goes back to ah. how confident you feel about stating things to juries with no evidential base. Um, so judicial knowledge isn't shared by all judges? Well, it ought it to be shared by all judges, all right, but it depends. There, there, comes, there comes a point um, where, say, a, 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 a principle of um, 
of mathematics becomes um, something which is, requires expert evidence. And exactly where that line right. is drawn, um, the, 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 you, you may know there's a, a railway line between Edinburgh and, and Glasgow, but you might not necessarily know the composition of the points at Winchborough. It, 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 it's, it, it's a matter of degree as to what is or is not within the knowledge okay. of, the, of, of I knew, people. I knew I didn't want to ask that question. I've asked <laughs> okay. it. I'm going to thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I have to go on because we've got much more to do. Can I thank you very much for a very intriguing evidence session, some of it quite pithy, because I'm allowed to use that word now as you've you defined it for us, uh, Lord Carraway. Um, thank you very much, and I'll just suspend for a couple of minutes allow the witnesses to, to leave. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.